great. Good morning, everyone. How are you doing today? Good. Fabulous. I'd like to welcome all of you here in the theater and those of you on YouTube to the National Archives and our opening weekend for Remembering Vietnam. Um, this is an exhibit that is media-rich in exploration of the Vietnam War. It features interviews with American and Vietnamese veterans and civilians with first-hand experience in the war's events, as well as historical analysis. It is a fascinating collection of newly discovered iconic original documents, images, film footage, and artifacts that illuminate 12 critical episodes in the war that divided people in both the United States and Vietnam. If you haven't already had the opportunity, I invite you to go and check that out upstairs in the O'Brien Gallery. Before we get started, I'd like to mention a few of our other upcoming programs. Uh, to continue with our opening weekend celebration, today at 2 o'clock, we will have the film We Were Soldiers, introduced by Vietnam vet and journalist Joseph Galloway. It depicts a true story of the first major battle between the United States and North Vietnamese forces. Um, this film will be rated R for language and violence. Um, our next family program also takes place here in the theater. On Saturday, December 9th, we will be joined by Cynthia and Stanford Livingston, and they will be sharing their book, Fault Lines in the Constitution, and engage readers with the question, does government established by the Constitution meet the goals that it set out to accomplish in a program for ages 10 and up and their families? Enjoy hands-on Constitution-related activities before the 11 o'clock discussion and a book signing following the discussion. Um, if you enjoy these programs and others offered here at the National Archives, we invite you to join our National Archives Foundation, and you can uh, find more information online or in the lobby. Um, at the conclusion of this program, we invite you to share your feedback with us. You'll find a QR code and website on the bottom of your programs today, or hard copy evaluations in the lobby. Um, we also would like to invite you to join us for a book signing upstairs uh, outside of our shop after this program. And without further ado, I am happy to introduce Frances Dell. She is the author of Shooting the Moon and many other award-winning books. Frances? Hi, the lights are bright. Um, it's really an honor to be here today, and I want to say thank you for coming out. I wanted to start today by reading a little bit from Shooting the Moon, just the first chapter. It's a pretty short chapter, and I think it'll give you a flavor of the book. And then I'm going to talk some about how I came to write it and my own experience uh, being an army brat, which I am. OK. Shooting the Moon, by the way, um, it takes place in 1969. And the setting for this chapter is Fort Hood, Texas. The day after my brother left for Vietnam, me and Private Hollister played 37 hands of gin rummy, and I won 21. They were speedball games. The cards slapped down on the table fast and furious. My brother TJ was going to war, and I was fired up hotter than a volcano. TJ and I had grown up in the Army. We were the Colonel's children, but that was not the same as being a soldier in the very heart of combat. Whoa, ha, slow down, was the first thing Private Hollister said when I charged into the rec center that morning, ready for action, but not exactly knowing what to do with myself. I'd been a rec center volunteer for three whole days, which had mostly involved picking up crumpled Coke cans from under the pool tables and handing out ping pong paddles to soldiers. But now I couldn't settle myself down enough to go check the chore list on the clipboard Private Hollister kept on his desk. I wanted to spin around in circles, do jumping jacks, drop to the floor for a hundred push-ups. Big things were happening, and the excitement of it all was running through my veins and winding me up tight. Here, sit. Private Hollister pulled out his desk chair and motioned me to take a seat. You got the look of a girl who don't know whether she's coming or going. He sat down across the desk from me. You ever play cards? Because back home in Kentucky, when we get too rowdy, my mom would get out the cards and get us playing poker or hearts, just anything to make us sit down for a few minutes and relax. I nodded. All at once, my excitement had found a place to land. I took a deep breath to calm myself and tried to look innocent, like a girl who maybe played old maid or crazy eights from time to time. Well, then reach into that top desk drawer and pull out a deck of cards. You know how to play gin rummy? I nodded again. 
I think so, I said, sounding doubtful. As a matter of fact, the colonel had taught me how to play gin when I was six, and there was no one alive who could beat me two games in a row. But I kept a straight face as Private Hollister explained the rules to me, told me about runs and knocks and how to keep score. Private Hollister leaned forward and picked up the cards. I'll go ahead and deal first, just to get us started. You think you understand how to play? I'm pretty sure, I said. Just tell me if I mess up. He smiled. Private Hollister had the face of a 10-year-old, about a thousand freckles across his nose, sticking out ears, eyelashes like a girl's. It was hard to believe that he was a grown man, but looking around at the soldiers playing pool and pinball, it was hard to believe any of them were full-fledged adults. They all looked like TJ, barely five minutes out of high school. So what's got you so full of beans today anyway, Private Hollister asked, shuffling the cards, or are you always this way and I just ain't noticed it yet? I swayed in my seat, the excitement rearing up in me again. My brother just left for Vietnam. He's going to be a combat medic for the 51st Medical Company. He's the third generation in my family to join the Army. I'd join, too, if they'd let me. How old are you, anyway? Eleven? You think they let many eleven-year-olds enlist? I will be 13 in December, I told him, sitting up as straight as I could, so maybe I would look old and mature. Not that I cared what people thought about my appearance, but even if I wasn't pretty in an obvious way, if my hair was just barely blonde instead of gold and yellow, if my eyes were gray instead of blue, even if I was as scrawny as a bundle of twigs, there was no doubt in my mind I looked at least 12 and a half. In fact, I said to Private Hollister, my mom's due date was in November, only I came later than they thought I would, so I'm closer to 13 than my birthday would have you believe. Uh, well, you look 11. I got a sister back home in Kentucky who's 11, so that's how I know. Private Hollister began dealing. You really a colonel's daughter? Yeah. I didn't want to sound snobbish about it, but I didn't want to sound so friendly that he thought it was okay to mistake me for an 11-year-old. Full bird? I nodded. Man, oh man. Private Hollister shook his head. I better not mess up around you. I might find myself in country too. In what country? Vietnam, that's what they call it when you're there. They say you're in country. But me, I want to be way, way out of country, if you know what I mean. I shook my head and shared disbelief. You're a soldier. You're supposed to fight. Private Hollister put down the deck, picked up his hand. Maybe, he said, but from what I've heard, I'd rather be here than there. No offense to your brother. Actually, he wasn't planning on going, I said, fanning out my cards to see what hand I'd been dealt. He was supposed to go to college, but then he changed his mind. You want me to start? Yeah, go ahead. Then Private Hollister cocked his head to one side and raised an eyebrow, like what I'd said just hit him. Your brother could have gone to college, but he went to Nam instead? I discarded, picked up a card from the top of the deck. I guess he got his priorities straight. Man, oh man, giving up college for a chance to dance with a bouncing Betty. One of them things falls at your feet, whammo, it blows up right in your face. Private Hollister shook his head sorrowfully, discarded, drew a card. I picked up his card, discarded, wrapped my knuckles against the desktop. Knock. Private Hollister practically fell out of his chair. You're knocking? How can you be knocking already? Skinner's luck, I guess. I spread out my cards on the desk, a run of five, seven of diamonds through the jack, plus a pair of threes and a pair of queens. You scammed me. I don't know what you're talking about. Just give me your cards and let me deal. Then it was one hand after another, cards slapping, knuckles knocking, and me staying ahead the whole way through. All right, Pri Private Hollister said when game 37 was over. He looked at his watch. I think I've gotten you calmed down enough. You ready to do a little work? Combat ready, I said. Private Hollister laughed. You're army all the way through, ain't you? I'm army through and through, I told him. I meant it, too. I mean it. If they let me go to Vietnam tomorrow, I'd go. I could be an ambulance driver or something like that. You even know how to drive a car? Of course I know how to drive a car, I lied. I've been driving since I was eight. We were stationed in Germany then, and in Germany they let anybody drive who can see over a steering wheel. Private Hollister stood up. Now I know you're lying. You've got to be 18 to drive over there. That's a fact. I shrugged. Must be a new law. Well, you might want to go to Vietnam, and you might be happy about your brother going to Vietnam, Private Hollister said, walking to the supply closet. But I know your mom ain't happy about it. 
My mother is an army mom, I said. I took the broom he handed me from the closet. She knows that wars have to be fought and we need soldiers to fight them. What you're talking about is philosophy, Private Hollister said. I'm talking about feelings. Ain't no mother happy about her son going to war. She'll be happy when we win, I told him. Private Hollister looked skeptical. If you say so. I don't just say so, I know so. And I did know so. I knew it like I knew my name, Jamie Dexter. I knew it like I knew my birthday, December 10th. I knew it like I knew the flag, 50 stars, 13 stripes, red, white, and blue, all in all, a piece of cloth worth going to war for. I was six months away from turning 13, and I thought I knew everything. So when I started writing this book, well, even before I started writing this book, I had no idea what I would be writing about. In fact, it had never occurred to me to write about being an army brat. And it was my husband's suggestion. And to be honest, when he suggested it, my first thought was, who would want to read about that? It's so mundane, so run of the mill. Well, of course it was to me because I'd grown up as an army brat. But the more I thought about it, I thought, well, it wouldn't be run of the mill or every day to everyone else. Maybe this is a really interesting topic I could write about. The only thing is, I didn't have a story in mind. I had me, and I thought, okay, I could write about a 12-year-old version of me. Um, but to write a book, to write a story, you need three things. You need a main character, a protagonist, you need a situation, and you need a conflict that rises out of that situation. In my own life, while it had problems and you know conf little conflicts, it didn't have any big drama to draw from. So I had this idea, why not set this book during the Vietnam era? Because of course that was a source of conflict for a lot of families. And when I first started writing, I had this idea that TJ would register for the draft on his 18th birthday, but he would register as a conscientious objector, right? He would be a CO. And this, of course, would cause huge problems with his family. They're an army family. They'd be like, what is this? Our son, our brother, refusing to fight? And that's the book I started out to write. And I wrote a few chapters of it, and I found myself losing interest in the story. And I think that was partly because it's kind of a story that's already been told, right? We know the story about the conscientious objector and conflict with his family. And I don't know, I felt like it wasn't particularly original or new. And the other thing I didn't like about this idea, that the story that I'd already started to write, is I knew where it was going. I knew that it would end up with some kind of message of peace and love and reconciliation. And you know, those are really good things but I don't like knowing how my stories will end up. I want to be surprised in the process of writing them. So I decided I would flip the idea. And instead of having TJ register as a conscientious, conscientious objector, I had him enlist. And his parents lost it. And Jamie couldn't understand why the colonel and her mother didn't want TJ to serve. And then I had a conflict, and then I had a story to write. Now, the great thing when I set out to write Shooting the Moon in this version is I did have so much of my own experience to, to bring to the story, and that was really a lot of fun. You know, I come from a particular subculture, that is the subculture of the army brat. And I knew a lot about it. And, and, and you know some things too, right? Even if you're not an army brat, you know the army brats move all the time, and that we're really good at meeting new people because that was our way of surviving. When you move every two or three years, you know how to walk into a room and make a new friend. And in fact, that was a big thing for me growing up. I always had to make a new friend the first day that I moved to a new town, and I always did. So army brats are really good at walking into rooms and saying, hello, I'm here. We also have, um, army brats have in common an unusual or <laughs> enforced respect for authority, right? Most army brats you meet call all adults in their life ma'am and sir, and especially their parents, right? You say, yes ma'am, yes sir. And I have to tell you that my big act of teenage rebellion uh, was when, when I was a t uh, my dad, my, I should tell you, my childhood nickname was Missy. So my dad would call up the stairs, Missy? And I would say, yes. And that was it. That was my act of teenage rebellion, which was immediately squelched, right? Because my dad would say, yes, what? And I would say, yes, sir. 
That's how long it lasted. Anyway, so that's, we grew up with that, with a, a very strong respect for authority. We also grew up with strange customs, like the phone would ring, and you would pick it up, and you would say, Colonel O'Rourke's quarters, Missy speaking. And my civilian friends were like, why don't you just say hello? I'm like, that's insufficient information. But I have to say now that I say hello all the time, I do not answer. <laughs> Dow's quarters, Francis speaking. Um, and I, have, I look back at that, like, that's a really weird way to answer the phone. But we did it because that's what we did. We were army brats. Now, what you might not know is that army brats are great singers. We are trained from an early age by soldiers and formation. How many of you know what a cadence is? Good, some of you do. We have some army people in here. It's a, it's a call and response kind of song, right? And the, probably the most famous one that you might be you, uh, is... I want to be an airborne ranger. And actually, you should sing that back to me. I want to be an airborne ranger. Live a life of guts and danger. You're good. This is good. This is what we, you know, walking around, you would hear these soldiers singing. Again, you'd have the leaders sing out the first line, and then they would repeat it. And the great thing when you're a kid is a lot of these songs are really rude. You know, they're not the songs that your mother would be happy to know you were walking around post or sitting on a bus on the way to a ball game singing. And that's, of course, one of the reasons we really love singing them. And in fact, one of my favorite cadences went, Sergeant, Sergeant, turn in green. Okay, and that's where we're stopping, because this is being live streamed on YouTube, and my mom is watching. So we can't finish it, but we can say that something really bad happened in the sergeant's canteen. And we went around singing about this a lot, and it was really fun. So being an army brat comes with all these interesting and kind of unusual customs and folkways. And I could bring those to the book. I could bring to the book that is set in Fort Hood, Texas, the fact that someone, some poet, thought to name a street Tank Destroyer Boulevard, which is my favorite street name ever, Tank Destroyer Boulevard. Yeah, take a left off to Tank Destroyer Boulevard. So I brought this all. I had all this knowledge to bring to my book. Now, Shooting the Moon is set in 1969. In 1969, I was five years old. I do have an older brother. At that time, he was eight. So we did not have the conflict that um, the Dexters have. Now, my brother didn't serve in Vietnam, but my father did. And I may have a picture. Like I said, it's a very basic. Let's see. Yeah, my father. This is my father in Saigon. My father's name is Della Rourke. He is a retired brigadier general. He was in the JAG Corps, and he served in Vietnam from 1971 to 1972. So in some ways, my immediate experience of him of Vietnam was my dad being away for a year. I was in second grade by this time. And you know, we, Vietnam was the first televised war, but honestly, we did not watch it on television. Um, my mother wouldn't let us. And so all I knew is that my dad was gone. And then a year later, he came back. And that was kind of it. I didn't know anything about the politics of the war or why, even why my dad went over. My first real experience of Vietnam in a way came a couple years after the war ended. We uh, were living in Charlottesville, Virginia. That's where the Army JAG school is, the Army Law School. And my mom would come up here to Fort Belvoir to do her big monthly grocery shopping. And sometimes I would come with her because she would buy a lot of groceries. And I was in, at this time, like fourth grade, fifth grade. And you would turn the corner. You'd be walking down the aisle, and you'd turn a corner. And suddenly, you'd run into a soldier who was missing an arm or a leg. And I was a kid, and that scared me. It really did. I remember I would get this hollow out, hollowed out cold feeling in my stomach when I saw these soldiers. And I really started to dread going to the commissary. And I didn't realize then, but I realized later that I was seeing Vietnam vets who had come back from the war. And what I realized even later when I was doing research is that the number of amputees who came back from Vietnam, it was an increase of 300% from World War II. And now there are a couple of reasons for that. Is one, peop one, one thing is because of helicopters, um, and you may have seen the helicopters out front, people survived, the soldiers survived wounds that they would not have survived in World War II because um, they were able to get medical care much more quickly. The other thing is the kind of warfare that it was. And Private Hollister, for instance, talks about bouncing beddies. We talk about mines, right? So that you would sustain the kind of in in injuries that might lead to the loss of a limb. So that was my first real experience of Vietnam. 
When I started writing Shooting the Moon, I thought I knew a lot about two things. I thought I knew a lot about the Vietnam War. But if you had asked me before I started working on Shooting the Moon when it started, when Vietnam started, I would have told you 1967. I was sure that it had started in the late 60s, but I was wrong. Does anyone know what year we sent combat troops over? 65. 65. We had, we had troops and soldiers over earlier than that even. Some would say that the, our involvement in Vietnam really started in the 50s, and some might say the Vietnam War is really rooted in actually the late 19th century. It's a really long history. But we sent our first combat troops over in 65. So I turn, it turned out I didn't know that much about the war at all. Um, I also thought I knew a lot about the Army. I'm an Army brat. I grew up in... I grew up in that culture, but you know, I knew how to sing rude songs, but I didn't actually understand like chain of command. I didn't, there were a lot of things I needed help with. So I called my dad, Del O'Rourke, and I said, Dad, Jamie needs to volunteer somewhere, somewhere on post where she's going to run into a lot of soldiers. Where could that be? And my dad said, the rec center. I'm like, oh, that makes perfect sense. And I could think of rec centers that I'd visited and spent time in, and particularly the one in Bad Kreuznach, Germany, in Rose Barracks. Because when I was in eighth or ninth grade, I, we lived there, and I got interested in photography. And I learned how to develop film. Some of you young people here, you've heard of film, and that we used to put it in cameras. And I've gone to do school visits to talk about shooting the moon, and teachers in preparation for my visit will do these big presentations on photography in the 1960s where you had these little canisters that contained little film thingies. And, you, and there was this whole, and the kids were like, wow, that's really cool. Um, so I had learned to do that. And a friend of mine had taught me in the rec center where there were dark room and there were a dark room and facilities to do that. And in fact, this changed the course of the book. Because when, at first I thought, well, that would be kind of a cool thing for Jamie to do, to learn how to develop film, process film, and print photographs. And then I thought, what if, when TJ goes to war, what if he's the photographer? And he takes pictures, and he sends the role of, of film back to Jamie to develop. And in this way, because they've always had this, he, TJ and Jamie, you know, the brother and sister, she's a real tomboy, and when they're kids, like, they played war. They had war games, and they were very romantic about what war was, their thoughts about what the war would be. And so when, J, when TJ goes, he sends pictures back as a way to show, instead of tell, Jamie, about his experience of the war. And the early pictures are very benign, you know, just GIs hanging out. Um, as the, summer, the, the book takes, uh, takes place over the course of the summer. As the summer goes on, he's sending pictures that are more difficult to look at. And so the early pictures, although the, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I'll get to that. Anyway, so if it weren't for my dad suggesting, hey, have her volunteer in the rec center, I might not have ever gotten to that thing that became very central to the book, these photographs. My dad helped me decide what Jamie's dad would do. He would be chief of staff, a third corps, right? And that allowed him to sign orders, or not sign orders, for soldiers going over to Vietnam. And Private Hollister, who we meet in the first chapter, although he's working in the rec center, is actually a radio operator. And he hears rumors that his unit is going to go to Vietnam. And he asked Jamie for help, and can her father help? And as a, as a matter of fact, whether he will or not, I won't tell you, but because he's chief of staff, he's the one who could to say, I won't sign off on this order. Got that information from my dad. So he was a very important part of writing the story, giving me plot points that really shaped what the story would become. I had other resources. I read a lot. Um, Tim O'Brien, who's widely regarded as the poet laureate of the Vietnam War, wrote both novels and nonfiction. Um, there's a lot of great oral histories. Everything we had is a, a collection of oral histories from soldiers who served in Vietnam. And that's one way that I learned about what happened in the war. I also went to the internet a lot. I went to the internet to look up maps. I, I went to the internet to look up TJ's photographs. Um, you know, because I was interested in what kind of pictures, we've all seen a lot of pictures, there are iconic photographs from the Vietnam War, but they're also just regular pictures um, of soldiers hanging out. And the internet is, you know, we're in the National Archives, the internet is another kind of archive for things like this. If you go looking, you can find pictures that soldiers took. But as I said, over the course of the summer, the pictures that TJ sends are more like this. They're, they're more disturbing. And um, so I was able to 
envision in my own mind the kind of pictures that he might be sending to, to Jamie over the course of that summer. So the internet was very useful. It was also helpful because online there are a lot of Vietnam War uh, vets forums where people go and they talk about their experiences of the war. And I learned a lot about what a soldier's life would be on a day-to-day -day basis and what people experienced over the course of their time that they served. Um, and I'm going to move just to, so we'll leave that. Um, that led me to one of my favorite parts of writing Shooting the Moon, which was the slang. When my dad came back from Vietnam, he started calling things number 10 and number 10,000, which we thought was weird. Also, he started listening to Credence Clearwater Revival, which we thought was super weird because he'd left listening to folk music, like, you know, the Kingston Trio. He came back listening to Credence. But he would, if something was bad, all of a sudden it was number 10. And if something was really bad, it was number 10,000. And that got me thinking. It's like, what other slang was there? And the internet was a great source of Vietnam War slang. And some of this is just general army slang, but I'm going to read you just a couple pages to give you an idea. Working at the rec center, I was learning more about Vietnam all the time. It was in the air you breathed if you were spending your days around GIs, some of whom had already done their tour, some of whom were gearing up to go, and a whole bunch who had their fingers crossed the war would be over before their units got called up. Sergeant Bird gave me daily vocabulary lessons. Sometimes it was like he was still in country, and there were days I thought maybe he wanted to go back. And Sergeant Bird, by the way, is the, the soldier who teaches her how to develop film. Every once in a while, he made me feel scared, the way his face got dark and cloudy over something he saw in one of TJ's pictures. There wasn't ever a time when he didn't want to talk, though. He was a big talker, someone who liked words for words' sake, the sound of them, the way you can pile them up in your mouth and make a poem if you spill them out the right way. If you recall, you call that a cracker box, he said, pointing to a picture of an ambulance I printed from TJ's fourth roll of film. The box sai rides in the cracker box. Box sai is what you call medic. It's a Vietnamese word. Or they go, into they go in the traveling medicine show, which is what you call the medevac helicopter. How come they do that, I asked. I mean, how come they make up words for everything that already has its own word? I don't know. Maybe it makes it less real, more like a cartoon, something that's not happening directly to you. Or else it's just fun to do. The human animal is an endless creative creature in my experience. So I learned chop chop was food, and a daily daily was the anti-malaria pill GIs had to take. Medics were called docs and band-aids and box sai, and infantrymen were called grunts. An army helmet was a steel pot, and camouflage uniforms were nicknamed tiger suits. If you were KIA, you'd been killed in action, and if you were KBA, you'd been killed by artillery. A glad bag was a body bag. Expectants were wounded soldiers who were expected to die. What'd they call you? I asked Sergeant Bird when the vocabulary lesson got too filled with body bags and wounded soldiers for my comfort. He grinned. I was a first cab grunt and a cheap Charlie because I never spent any money in the bars. Other than that, mostly I got called Ted, which is my name, and a few other names too improper to repeat. Oh, and Kodak. I got called Kodak. He held up his camera bag for the obvious reasons. That, I have to say, was the, some of the funnest part of my research, was learning everything was called by another name when you were in Vietnam. The funny thing, rereading Shooting the Moon, the funny thing for me was to realize how filled it was with soldiers and how filled my life was when I was a kid with soldiers, when we lived on post. You didn't think anything about it. You'd go in the PX or the commissary, Stars and Stripes bookstore, walk around post. There were always soldiers around. And I realized that that's not really the case in my life anymore. I have some retired soldiers around, like my dad, um, but I live in Durham, North Carolina, and my life does not intersect with the military anymore. And it's an odd thing to me. And I thought about this recently when I read an article by a soldier, uh, a vet of the Afghanistan war. And he was writing about people thanking him for his service. Right? And he said he didn't like it when he was at the airport or out in public in his uniform and people came up and said, thank you for your service. Because he felt that so many people, so many Americans are so disconnected from the military, they don't know what they're thanking the soldiers for. 
And I understood that because I feel disconnected, right? And, and a lot of us do. From World War II through Vietnam, we had a draft. And that means everyone knew someone who served, whether it was a father or a brother, a neighbor, someone you went to school with. People knew soldiers. Now we have an all-volunteer army, and we know that a lot of people who enlist come from working-class communities. If you're not part of that kind of community, your, lives, your life doesn't intersect with the people who serve our country. And, you know, I'm sympathetic to the idea that if you thank someone for something and you have no idea what you're thanking them for, that that person may feel like your thanks are empty. But on the other hand, I feel that what we're doing right now, collectively, is dealing with some collective guilt about how we treated soldiers who came back from Vietnam. That we remember how they were treated. They were not given ticker tape parades, right? Like soldiers from World War II. Sometimes they were spit on, called names, and often they were just ignored and treated like they should be ashamed of their service. And so I think now people go up to soldiers and say thank you for their service, not only as a personal gesture of goodwill, but to make up for a wrong in our past. And in that way, I'm quite sympathetic to what they're doing. And what I think is this. I think that war is an incredibly personal experience. And that was one of the big things I learned researching Shooting the Moon, and more recently watching the Ken Burns documentary. Soldiers come back from war with very personal stories of what happened to them. And we tend to not forget that because the way we talk about the military is in a very distant way, right? We talk about troops, we talk about units, we talk about battalions, but we very rare, rarely just talk about people. And so I think um, what I would love to see is more stories about soldiers and their experiences. I think it would be great to know what we're actually thanking these soldiers for. Now, like I said, I don't have a lot of soldiers in my life anymore. I don't carry a military ID. I can't get into the PX for the really good prices. I have two sons, Jack and Will. They have a hometown. They have, we have lived in the same house for 10 years and in the same town for 15. That all seems really weird and slightly wrong to me, right? But given that, you know, when people ask me where I'm from. I used to say, I was talking to someone earlier who's a BP brat. There are a lot of different kinds of B, uh, brats. There are IBM brats and BP brats and, and Army brats. And um, I used to say what she said, which is when people asked you where you were from, I'd say nowhere. Because no, I couldn't say, well, I was born in Berlin. I'm not from Berlin. Graduated from high school in Colleen, Texas. I'm not from Colleen. So now what I say, I say what Jamie Dexter says in Shooting the Moon. I say, I'm from the United States Army, and I am, and I'm proud of that, and I'm proud of my dad, Del O'Rourke, who, if you're watching, thank you for your service. I'm proud of my grandfather, who also served. And what I'd like to say today, if any of you served, thank you for your service, and I hope you'll tell us your story. So thank you very much, and I would be very happy to answer any questions you have about writing, about shooting the moon, about my own experience. And there are mics on either side if you have some questions. Or you could just raise your hand. No questions? OK, well, I'll be doing a book signing, and I would be glad to talk to anyone there. Thank you so much for coming out. I really appreciate it. <laughs>